Welcome to the Cometamorphosis Podcast, where we explore the possibilities and processes of personal and community transformation based on the ancient wisdom of Kemet, one of many classical African civilizations, as a foundation. I am Dr. Katherine Lynn Adams, an Associate Professor of African and African American Studies at Claflin University where I teach courses on oral and literary traditions of the African world with an emphasis on interviewing and archiving the stories of our elders. I am serving as a scribe for this project. Joining me is Baba Derek Jackson. Baba Derek is the priest and thought leader of Christ Universal Temple, a spiritual community in South Carolina. First, a clip from a concerned group of men and Project Sankofa, part one. Joe Benton was in the Department of Juvenile Justice. He was a social worker. Uh, Nana Joe, as we call him at the temple, Makaru, was the commissioner of youth services at the highest level. What I mean by that is that he had that post under President Jimmy Carter. And so when he came back to South Carolina from that big time cabinet post, the Department of G, uh, Juvenile Justice, and at that time it was called the Department of Youth Services. It later changed its name to the Department of Juvenile Justice. He became one of those people who DJJ used to um, facilitate between the, uh, the DJJ here in the state of South Carolina and the federal government, since he was just leaving the federal government. Then eventually, they made him the assistant commissioner of the state, and then Eventually, he created this center called St. Saint, Saint Louis Center, where it was a center for youth who had been in prison, and they were getting ready to go home. And it was like their transition from that from one state of being to the next. And in there, he was doing a lot of work helping um, youth to understand what happened to them and then to understand they could do better. And Dr. Gorman was going around doing um, lectures on history, on African history. And so it was the three of us putting our heads together and saying, Let's do something together. That that was the beginning of um, Project Sankofa. Let us see what else that we can possibly do that's not necessarily tied to the school system. By that time, a certain group of men had broken up and we, we were main friends and, and contacts and resources but by that time, people had started moving in different directions. And so that's why it was easier for me to move right into Project San what became Project San Cofa. And now, part two, Project San Cofa. So take me to the early conversations that you are then having in 1990 that result in Project Sankofa? By 1990, we were a part of an organization called ASCAP, the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilization. We had been part of that organization. Well, I 
my original membership started in 88 with ASCAT. And so by 90, we were pretty um, familiar with some of the people in ASCAT. And we were bringing some of the people from ASCAT to Columbia, like Dr. Jeffrey, like James Small, right? And um, Shashi McIntyre, Francis Cress Wilson. <laughs> we were bringing here, and so we were having discussions about what was going on in Columbia because from 87 to 90, what was going on in Columbia had gotten worse. And more people were asking, what can we do? Because by 90, you have legitimate gangs here. You have the police chief, who was a black police chief named Austin, screaming about gangs. But in his speaking of uh, and screaming about gang, uh, still the adult population here wasn't hearing him, wasn't feeling him. And, and it, despite the statistics that he was showing them, and I, uh, and, and, and Dr. Gallman, uh, Joe Benton and myself understood they had no reference point the adult community, black adult community, to understand gang life in the way that it was being visited here in Columbia. Because the gang life came out of urban centers. And they were being organized the way they are organized in urban centers, not based on small town southern. Um, southern um, states and, and southern areas. And because they had no references and these people were in decision-making position. That was the unfortunate part because they blocked people who could have helped and could have done something about it because they were doing what we call protecting their turf. That's a street term. <laughs> but children were suffering and dying because they felt like somebody was invading their turf. So we had to deal with a lot of that. The thing that about Dr. Gorman and Joe Benton was that ability to cut through that tape. Where with concerned group of men, we were all from out of the state of South Carolina. With, with Joe and Bernie, even though Joe grew up in Seattle, he had lived in Columbia since the, since the uh, early 60s. Since 62, 63, he had been living in South Carolina. So Joe was embedded to the point that people looked at Joe as if Joe had grew up here in Columbia, right? And Bernie grew up in Hartsfield. So they could open doors that we couldn't <laughs> in the concerned group of men. So that made our path just a little bit easier, um, breaking down those barriers and, and, and creating relationships that allowed us to, um, to go to places, not just in Columbia, but throughout the state. How did you decide on the name for the project? That's a good question that word Sankofa was starting to become popular in the African Senate community and going to these ASCAT conferences you heard that word 
Sankofa a lot. And the idea of using a Dinkra symbol as a way of being uh, as a symbolic imagery to represent something you might want to do or any programs that you want to run. And so we felt like out of the Adinkra symbol, Sankofa, the Sankofa bird represented what we wanted to do, go back and fetch it. But we didn't say just go back and fetch it, go back and fetch it and make it better than it was before. And that comes out of the Shabaka text. How do you select the young people that you're working with and how do you come together? Well, the first group, because Joe, Nana Joe Benton had something called St. Luke's Center, we were able to bring it to DJJ because of his position in DJJ. And what's interesting how Nana Joe and I got to know each other pretty well was at the Monday night study group, he, he was asking people if they wanted to volunteer to come down to his St. Luke's Center and help with some of the things he was trying to teach the young men based on what we were studying in the study group. And um, I told him, I said, yeah, I'm, I'll come and volunteer and do some work. So Joe agreed and he told me where St. Luke Center was. <laughs> but he didn't believe, uh, Dr. Adams, that I was going to come. He thought I was one of those people, just like most people, who say they're going to do something but don't show up, right? So when I showed up and he thought I was just coming to visit him at work and see so St. Luke Center, I said, no, I came to volunteer. He said, you came to, you really came to volunteer? And I said, yeah. And he said, wow. And then he put me to work. You know, but the thing I liked about what he did was first show me the operation. Show me how they do things at St. Luke's Center. Show me some of the concepts he was using to help these young men and women transition back into home life. And he had a parenting program, teaching the parent. And I'm going there because we used some of the things Dr. Gallman had been teaching, some of the things that Joe was doing in his um, St. Luke Center, and some of the things I brought with Concerned Group of Men. So in that, we didn't have to select the kids. The kids were already there, <laughs> right? Because they were part of Joe's program. But the component Joe already had a parenting program as part of his program. So we adopted that parenting program as part of Project Sankofa. We wanted the parent to understand what we were trying to do in our rights of passage program. And they had to buy in because it had to be voluntary because of DJJ. Because it's not a DJJ program. This is something we doing outside of DJJ, but DJJ was allowing us to use their facility in order to conduct this program. And that helped us shape and mold to what became Project Sankofa. That helped us cut out, add, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> and shape in a way that came more concise, understanding how you use visuals, how you um, use field trip visuals through um, video, understanding that you don't 
do anything more than 15 minutes. Because <laughs> anything over 15 minutes, you don't lost the crowd, right? You don't lost these young men. And then make it interact. Always keeping the young men involved in whether we talk about the video, whether we talk about the field trip, make sure you asking them questions in your teaching that uh, brings them in to whatever you're talking about. Don't do like you do um, in school or at college where the professor gets to do all the talking and you just get to do the list. With these young men, you can't do that. I wouldn't even advise you to do that. So how many people, how many young people were there at its inception? For the first group? For that first group, 15. And what were their ages? The group, it was the 14 to 17. Explain a little bit about maybe the middle of the project. Um, you know, how how does it progress and what would you consider the height of the program? Mm. At its height, we were able to do what we call train training. Train other people to run a rites of passage program. Not our program, we said, you're not obligated to run Project Sankofa, but we wanted to teach you the elements of a rites of passage program that you might want to do. Like you, we might want to teach you about, you know, how to use a video, how to make it interactive, but we want you to create those details based on the community you live in. Let's say, for instance, when we go to Bennettsville, Marion County, we're not going to tell the people in Marion County what they should be teaching in Marion County. But we will talk about how to teach it. <laughs> okay? Because Marion County being a little different than Richland County, there's some aspects of it we don't know because we don't live there. And a better example is when we did a rites of passage program in Bennettsville, and we were teaching the young men about the history of the town they lived in, they couldn't believe, <laughs> you know, that somebody like um, Chancellor Williams was born right there in Bennettsville. And right here in Bennettsville, they couldn't believe it. And so one of the things we like to do is come early, find out the look about the area, find out, develop a relationship with some of the local people, whether it's the postman, whether it's the garbage man, doesn't matter but just develop that relationship. So when we start doing the program, we will use them to tell the history of the area. And when these young men see that these are the people they know <laughs> and they've seen, like when we went to Bennettsville, we went to the local barbershop and the kids, you know, they knew the guy in the barbershop because they dad bring them there and they go there. And they never thought of him as a historian, right? And here they were sitting there listening to him tell the history of Bennettsville. And they was, wow, we didn't know. Mr. Jones knew all that. When we come in here, we only get our hair cut. And we listen to him talk to our dad or our uncle. But we didn't know. <laughs> So it gave the young men an appreciation, not only for the history, but to look at these adults who they've seen in a different way, if that makes sense to you. How did you select the sites 
where you ran the program and then were there cycles or how long did the program run for each group of of young people? We didn't select the sites. The sites select us. Communities who heard about our program invite us to first maybe run a program then teach others how to run a program once we leave. And then we were fortunate, very, very, very fortunate to join in in the Children's Defense Fund under Marion Wright Elderman. Stay tuned for the continuation of the journey regarding rites of passage programs in South Carolina. We want to archive something special that was established in 2000, more than two decades ago. In upcoming episodes, we will be exploring the history of Christ Universal Temple, its teachings on spirituality and personal growth, and its role in the Columbia, South Carolina community. We invite you to like, comment, and subscribe to receive notifications for future episodes. Thank you for listening.